Very good. Well, this is fun. We are, I don't know what we are. We're about week uh, or fifth. This is our fifth fireside chat. And uh, today we brought in a uh, special guest, a fellow featherweight uh, enthusiast, uh, David Werther from Quilters Connection in uh, Olympia, Washington. Um, David, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how long you've been in Olympia and where you were at before that, and maybe uh, how long you've been dabbling in featherweights and uh, all those other cool machines you got back there. Uh, all right, I'll give you the short version. Um, my, my wife grew up here in the Olympic Peninsula in uh, western Washington. She actually grew up in a logging camp. Oh. that's no longer there. It was the last permanent logging camp in the United States. It's now a forest service sign on the side of the road. But uh, she grew up up here, and we met uh, around 2001 or so. Um, she moved to Texas to marry me in 2003, which right there tells you a little bit about her sanity. <laughs> And uh, she, her, her mother owned a quilt shop. She was a quilter. She sewed. She was ten, and uh, she had been a quilter for many years. And in two thousand five, she bought this long arm machine that you see behind me. And when you buy one of those long arm machines, they bring it to your house, set it up, and they show you how to maintain it. And you pretty much have to be your own sewing machine mechanic because you don't just throw that in the back of the car and take it into the shop. Right. So that, that job fell to me, being an old car guy, a mechanical, hands-on kind of guy, that job fell to me. And then, uh, so she was a long-arm quilter. So she would, she would go into the local quilt shop near our house just about every day for this or that, thread or backing fabric or whatever it was. Finally, they said, well, why don't you just work here? So she went to work in the quilt shop. The owner of the shop uh, decided to close it about two years later. And in another lapse of judgment, my wife said, well, why don't we open the quilt shop back at the <laughs> same location? So uh, in 2007, we opened Quilters Connection a month after the previous shop closed in the same location with the same phone number. So about that time, somebody brought a little singer in a black box to her and said, hey, I know your husband works on your machine, your longer machine, can you, can you see if he can fix this? And I tinkered with it and fixed it. And then somebody else said, well, can you fix mine? And the next thing you know, within six months, it was a, it was a part of our quilt shop business. And so fast forward up to 2016, we had a, Shelly and I had an agreement that at some point we would move up here close to her family. Uh, and so in 2016, we closed the quilt shop the last day of October. And Shelly started packing for the move up to Olympia. And we moved up here in September 2017. We have this separate building that you see behind me or part of it behind me. We have the separate building on our property that's about 1,500 square feet and finished out as a self-contained apartment. And that the, the whole idea for our dream for many years was to set this up as a quilting studio, long arm studio, classroom, and where I would work on machines. And that's how we got to where we are. So at this point, um, I've, I've been buying and selling machines and working on them since about 2008 or nine. Uh, up to now, I've owned uh, over 260 featherweights, uh, some of which you can still see behind me. Part of that's a collection and part of it is machines ready to be, or not ready yet to be sold, but eventually to be sold and serviced a whole lot more. So I've learned a little bit about them and it's been a fascinating journey it, 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 particularly the people that you meet in this what for me is a business but in this uh, whole featherweight world it's really great people in it, and i've really enjoyed meeting them in the facebook groups and the people that have come in my shop 
That is good. That is great. So David, I'm going to pause here for just a second. Um, they're they're saying online that that um, they can't hear um, my mic uh, very well. So uh, Christian, right back by the where the mic plugs in, right there. There's a volume that you can turn that up. Uh, so just uh, clockwise, turn that up and watch your meter there on the screen. And I'll keep talking here for a second and uh, see if that uh, that raises the uh, raises the sound level a little bit. So a little better. Okay. So um, I'm actually getting plenty of feedback, so we must be we must be on loud enough now. Um, okay, are we getting some thumbs up. We got a little better sound going. Okay, very good. Well, uh, let's see, David. You and I first. Uh, well, we've chatted a lot uh, on the phone over the years, but I believe it was in 2016 that I met you uh, down in Dallas when we were traveling around the country and uh, and uh, had a class there and um, and we've kind of been um, oh we've shared ideas and and uh, um, a lot of uh, rare machines would come through the shop and and you would uh, uh, let me know when you got one and uh, and vice versa and so uh, we both kind of been both in the collecting and uh, servicing end of things and that's one of the things that you know I like about uh, the featherweight um, industry is uh, it's a friendly um, it's a friendly community and um, been a, a lot of sharing of information and uh, you know I've, I've learned um, you know, I didn't come up with hardly anything uh, on my own, but I learned from old guys that have been in the business for for decades and decades, and uh, people like Dave McCallum, and and um, you know, so it's it's a it's a fun industry to be in, and um, I, I will admit that right now with everything going on in the world, it's a little bit uh, a little bit crazy, but. Um, it's uh it's it's enjoyable and for us it's a family thing and um yeah i just uh, i love it so tell me a little bit you've got um i'm seeing lots of trapezoid uh cases back there um you know we the featherweight shop pretty much deals in featherweights and um but you on the other hand uh, you teach classes on like 301s um yeah uh, yes so Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we we discovered, if you want to use that word, the greatness of the 301s probably about 2010 or 11. Um, I had a I had a person come into our quilt shop and they said, you know, we're having an estate sale. We're just a couple of blocks from you. And in a couple of days, we're having an estate sale, and my and my father was a collected sewing machines, and he's got a whole bunch of these sewing machines in a little black box. Would you like to come look at them? Yeah, right. Like you had to ask. Mother <laughs> what. So uh, I went over to their house and walked in the room where they had all this stuff, and it was one of those moments. There was twelve or fifteen featherweight cases there, closed up. Uh, and you know that's one of those moments where I would stop and kind of close my eyes and say, "Please, Lord, let today be the day that <laughs> there's a Texas badge, Texas badge machine in one of these boxes." But they had uh, there wasn't, but they had a uh, uh, quite a few 301s. They had six or seven 301s. Some of them were just beautiful in a case. One of the one of the most more of the most pristine black long bed 301s I've ever seen mm -hmm. uh, was there um, and they were asking $40 a piece for them so I, we bought all of them we bought all of them that they had along with the, the folding tables because I'd heard a lot about them but hadn't really done much with the 301s and that's really set us on our journey to the 301 it, it's a fabulous machine not as not as lightweight or portable as the featherweight, but it's 
some things going for it, like a little better visibility because of the slant needle sure. and faster faster speed if you're if you're if you're requiring that. But they're great machines. They service almost exactly as most people know, they service almost exactly the same as a featherweight except for the motor with no belt and the direct drive. But it's got the same other two gear sets, same rotary hook system. Yeah. So I do a lot I do a lot of that business. I bought up some parts. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, one in particular parts dealer uh, in our Facebook groups that has been able to come on to a lot of 301s and parts. Uh, Colin Schroeder and I bought a lot of parts from him. And as you can see, uh, we have quite a few 301s, many of which are waiting to be serviced and sold. So, yeah, we do a bit. Of, and I've got an interesting one behind me here on the uh, deck of the long arm. This. Uh, Oka colored 301 has got a centennial badge ah. on it. There, were, there weren't many of those that's become pretty collectible. I bet I bet so. so. Is that one yeah, we really is that one really staying is that one staying in your collection or is that one gonna go up for sale someday? Yeah, that, one, that one's gonna stay around a while. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, this whole collector thing, mm -hmm. and I know I'm gonna hear about it from Anna Marie. <laughs> I'll just put that out there right now. I've, I've become a collector grudgingly or, you know, kind of kicking and screaming. I, I maintained for a long time that I was not a collector, nor could I afford to be. Mm -hmm. But I've been really, really blessed by the opportunity to pick up some machines uh, to have the, the good fortune to, to find them and then the wherewithal to pick them up. And so now we have a... a wrinkle finish featherweight and a chicago world's fair and we've got uh, a few black side machines so we've got some pretty cool collectible machines and so i guess you can definitely say i do have a collection and that one will stay in it for now yeah i've uh, i've been a little bit like you over the years as far as as far as collecting um which i've told i've had a lot of good machines that have come and gone over the years because uh, that's just what happens when you have kids and uh, you got shoes to buy instead but uh, now Christian has really gotten he's the one that's gotten into the collecting uh, for the most part so he's the one that um, he's the one that uh, has really built our, our collection now to what it is and, and some fun machines but hey they're telling me that we've got some got some questions coming up here so I'll uh, have them tell us and then I'll, I'll repeat them and, and see what we come up with here David that sounds great. So, question, April? They want to know where you're from, where you're located, because they talked about Dave's location. Okay, yeah, so they were just wondering uh, location-wise. So D David is in Olympia, Washington. I'm in what they would consider North Central um, Idaho. I often describe it that if you took the line between Oregon and Washington and drew that straight through Idaho, you would run into us. So we're both uh, in the Pacific Northwest. I am definitely in a drier part of the Pacific Northwest than, than David. And um, I have always been a, a, a Northwest, born and raised, um, Oregon and Idaho. So that's where we're at. Um, any servicing type questions we got coming, yes, April? Um, I, first time I opened up a new purchase, I found a Gibbs screw missing. How can I tell if the threads inside are stripped? Ah, uh, okay. So the question is, uh, they must have a new machine that has no Gibbs screw, and how can they tell if the um, if the threads are stripped on on the Gib Gibbs screw? And typically, um, I've got one here. Christian, can you put me on a different screen here, real quick? Um, so I've got a, um, I've got a, uh, a hook assembly right here, and I'm assuming we're talking about this Gibb screw in the middle of the Gibb hook, not the one that's from the back side. And um, the threads on that that hole are the same, no matter whether it's um, the newer style hook or the older one but uh, it's the slant of the screw head itself that is different and so therefore you got to have the correct screw um, so uh, David you probably have some originals around and and we do of course and so um, uh, so anyway that that's um, 
uh, if, if, that, if the correct screw uh, is put in there and it won't screw in, then, then either the screw or the, or the hook itself is, um, is stripped out. But uh, if you're trying to put that screw that's from the back side in there, it's not going to go in because it has no, um, it's a much smaller screw. And they're little tiny. It's like getting those little, almost like a screw for your, your glasses. Um, so. Yeah, they, the rotary hook body itself that the screw screws into is hardened. It is. That, that, that steel is going to be considerably harder than the screw, so it's unlikely that the hole itself is stripped out. The screw may be, and, yeah. and, it, and it was probably designed that way so that the screw is the sacrificial part. So yeah. I, would order, I would order a replacement screw once you determine... Like Carmen said, the, the later ones have a larger head on it and don't have the bevel in the back side. So once you determine which is the right screw for your hook, I'd order a new screw from Carmen and uh, that'll, that'll take care of it. Uh, or, or get one from David. The, the uh, um, uh, Paramount that you use a good, um, a, a good screwdriver. Um, because uh, you use the wrong size or a weakened screwdriver and you are going to destroy the head of that screw and then getting that out of there. Uh, first class I ever went to, a uh, lady had um, a destroyed um, uh, Gibbs screw like that and David or Dave McCallum had to take a little Dremel and, and cut through it. So basically I had to replace the, the Gib hook just to get that, that screw out. But anyway, if you have any other questions, yeah, you can post, uh, send us an email or whatever like that. Uh, next question. Why does the motor smell funny? Yeah. Why does the motor smell funny uh, when it's running? Oh, what would you say, David? The question is, why would a, the motor smell funny when it's running? Well, it, um, these motors have brushes in them, and they rely on the spring-loaded contact between the brush and the commutator ring on the armature. And so many of us of a certain age can remember seeing some of these motors in appliances, and you, if you could see the motor through the vent, yeah. louvers or, or vent holes in the whatever the appliance was you could often see sparks uh, when it's happening and it, although you don't really see the sparks in a featherweight motor uh, it, it produces ozone those 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 motors the brush motors produce a smell from that interface between the brush and the and the commutator ring and I think that's part of what you smell mm -hmm. certainly if there's if the motor's been over lubricated, if it's had oil in it, you're going to smell that as well. Yeah. I will also, I will also say that the white featherweights, when they run, they're stinkier than the black ones. Um, and I think it's a combination of somehow the motor's a little different, and it's also vented, right? Which the black U.S. featherweight motors are not. So the the white featherweights certainly are stinkier when they run, but I think it's. I think it's the smell is generated by just the operation of the motor, and a little bit of that odor is not it, it is not uncommon, and it's nothing to be alarmed about. Yeah. You, you yeah, totally. Um, you know, I, I think um, unless you've got that burning smell, that burning smell is a little different. Um, yep. And you know, better have the motor looked at before it does overheat, especially if somebody's put oil into it. But yeah, I've noticed that throughout the years uh, that those white machines, uh, the motors just they smell a little funny, uh, especially the newer sealed ones. And, and especially if it's not been run in a while, the mm -hmm. more you use them, the more you use them, the less you're going to smell. Yeah. So if you got a brand if you got a brand new to you machine that's been in somebody's closet for 20 years, yeah, it's going to be stinky for a while, but it'll that'll calm down. Yeah, yeah. So the main the main thing smells you know can be normal at that age, but it's the it's the smell and definitely smoke is when you you've got uh, something to be uh, concerned about. Uh, April, next question. The oiling hole on the top left of the machine. Why is it or is it did shown twice? Just explain that it's shown twice. It only needs oil once. You know what I'm about? Okay, so the question is the oiling hole on the top of the machine, and I'm going to tip this machine here so that they can see. Um, we're talking that one right there. A little bit difficult to see, but it's right behind that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's right, um, right behind that, the pressure knob. 
that adjusts the pressure on the presser foot. Uh, the question is, is why is that one basically listed twice um, on the uh, in the manual? And and basically, um, it doesn't need oil twice. Uh, I always make sure you know make sure you do it one one or the other. Um, and by twice, I mean that when you take the face plate off you can see it uh, from back in there and, and get to it that way as well. Um, but no, I, know exactly, I know exactly what, what they're asking about. On the, on the diagram for the top of the machine, there's a line pointing to that hole as a place to oil. And then when you look at the diagram for the inside the faceplate of the machine, it also shows a line going basically to the same place. Yeah. So, yeah, they're absolutely right. It is shown twice in the manual, but as you say, um, it, the most important thing, I think, is getting oil into the little reservoir hole at the top of that linkage. Right. Just like the other, the other four places uh, in, the link, in the linkage on the end where there's an oiling hole, mm -hmm. there's one at that location as well. Yep, yep, yep. Good question, though. You're right. Definitely uh, listed twice there. Uh, next question. Um, why is the tension loose in reverse? Okay, good good question. So why is the tension loose in reverse? Um, um, so when you're sewing when you're sewing backwards, um, the tension uh, looks looks loose um, there. What would you say, David? I was hoping you were going to take that question. <laughs> you know, it that is it is so bizarre. Some machines love to sew backwards, and they make it the same beautiful stitch backwards as they do forwards. And then other machines just do not like to sew backwards. Yep. It, you know, and I mean, it, it it works well enough to make a couple of stitches to back tack and finish off a seam, but you wouldn't want to do a whole lot of backward sewing. But it, that is a heck of a good question as to why the tension changes and the look of the stitches changes when all that's changing is the orbital path of the feed dogs to feed the fabric. Yep. I, I wish I had an answer for you. I'm, I'm willing to say I don't know the answer to that, but there is there's something in the way that... And, and I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with take up spring timing, right? You know, which which would not cause the which would cause the thread to not pull into a tight stitch. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's different. Um, yeah. And and that's the cause. But uh, I'd love to hear your take on this. Well, my my only my only thing that I've narrowed it down to is. Um, you know, can be feed dog position, um, you know, where feed dogs are positioned as far as how far their throw is that sometimes when you put it in reverse or even sharpness of the feed dogs, um, you just don't get that consistent stitch in reverse. I do remember because I've had this same uh, question before and uh, David and I both went uh, and Christian have all been to uh, Ray's uh, sewing machine school and, and I remember him talking about that in there that because somebody was asking, you know, uh, a proper looking stitch should look the same in, in forward as it does in reverse. And Ray said, no, that's not, that's not true. <laughs> you know, they're made, they're made to go forward and depending on hook location and stuff, you're not always going to get the same exact looking stitch in, in reverse. Um, Christian, did you have any input on that? Christian's our tech support today. Some of the universe can amplify tension issues. So tension may not be perfect. Yeah, and what Christian was saying is that uh, sewing in reverse does seem to amplify tension issues. So if you've already got tension issues, uh, sewing in reverse will often uh, make that more more evident. But um, yeah, overall, I would say uh, I don't have. Uh, oh, that's an obvious easy fix for that. You know, if it's if it's looping or something crazy, then then yes, there's definitely tension issues or something. But uh, the easiest good, fix for that is don't sew in reverse. The easiest fix is don't show sew in reverse. So yeah, I wonder who posted that posted that question. It was uh, maybe somebody just just trying to make uh, just show how little we know, David. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, but that's a good question. And. Uh, 
yeah you can always send us a video if you've if you've truly got issues where you're trying to sew in reverse and it's looping or hanging up or something like that definitely uh, shoot a video and, and send it to us or whatever and we'll look at it and try to try to work you through um, what could be causing it well if you think about what's going on when the needle presents the loop to the hook mm -hmm. and the hook that loop and and you know the whole stitch formation process the motion of the feed dogs you would think theoretically shouldn't be it shouldn't have anything to do with that but you know who knows as it's running that that reverse motion of the feed dogs may yeah, it may interfere with the thread path as the uh, top thread pulls the stitch tight. So, yep. You know, I, but but the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next question, Christian. Um, is it okay to polish? If you have a little spot of aluminum rot, is it okay to use design all over that? Okay, so somebody's asking um, about using um, like Zymol wax or whatever over the top of a little spot that has um, uh, a little uh, aluminum rust, um, aluminum rot. Um, you know, that's the white uh, flaky powdery stuff. I don't have that on, on this machine here or anything, but um, <clears throat> they don't want it to hurt their machine. They don't want it to hurt their machine. Um, my my thoughts are anytime you see some of that uh, aluminum rot you need you need to get it uh, you need to get it off uh, of there with uh, you know a little 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 brush or something of some kind I wouldn't probably uh, seal over it with wax without first trying to get the flaky stuff off there what uh, what do you think David yeah I think that's that's fair to say it's you know, it's oxidation because it, the aluminum is exposed, the paint's mm -hmm. gone off of it. So waxing over it sure isn't going to do you any good. And um, you're right, if you're going to keep the machine and if it's a long term, uh, you know, you're looking at the, the long term here, I would definitely try to, especially if it's just on the base, around the bottom of the base, which is where a lot of them start that. Exactly. I would sand off the area with sandpaper just try to get past that oxide layer and down to uh where you don't see it anymore mm -hmm. uh, and uh then seal it with some black paint yep. that kind of thing. but no i wouldn't i wouldn't just wax over it yeah yeah we use you know the little automotive just universal gloss black you know touch up paint in those in those scenarios if it's uh you know a personal machine that we're going to keep or whatever uh like that uh but yeah, that that's probably probably would be the best thing is to get rid of the oxidation that's there first, and then and then uh, protect it. So, Christian, next yeah, I love that. I love that. Uh, I love that Duplicolor Universal Black that comes from the auto parts stores. It works great. Yeah. Okay. So, next question is about a hook assembly that is rusted in place. I'm not sure if that's the base, so like it won't rotate or it's rust machine. rusted in place. Um, yeah, that's probably one that um, you'd probably have to uh, send some photos or whatever, because uh, is it rusted and it's stuck on the shaft? Uh, you know, a lot of times people think that uh, a hook assembly is, is rusted and locked up when in fact it has a thread jam or something actually in there that's causing that. Uh, rust, well, you know, <laughs> rust, not, rust is not going to go away on its own. Uh, so just like we're talking about with the aluminum rot, you've got to, uh, you've got to get down past it uh, uh, to protect it. Um, so that's probably what I would say would be um, probably need a little more information to truly uh, diagnose what um, what exactly we're referring to as far as a uh, hook assembly rusted in place. But if, yeah, if you're talking about the bobbin case base being rusted into the hook body or the gib arm being rusted where you can't get that open, but you can still get the two set screws out of the hub to take the hook off the shaft, mm -hmm. then replacing that replacing that whole rotary hook assembly is your best bet because yeah. don't forget don't forget with each stitch that you make the top thread has to pull over the top of, of that hook all the way around it and if it's rusted it, it's just the machine's not going to work right. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Okay, Christian, mm -hmm. you had a question. Uh, somebody posted a question about, uh, was it attachments? Yeah, the difference between 221 and 301 attachments. Okay, David, I'll let you uh, answer this one. People are wondering, uh, what are the differences in attachments between a 221 attachment and a 301 attachment? It, it just gets down to the uh, presser foot shaft itself. Uh, the 301, or let's back up. In the featherweight, the needle is vertical and goes straight up and down. In a 301, it was the first of Singer's slant needle machines see if I can bring this over. So I'm going to try to get this up close to the camera. Yeah, I think you can see that that, that those are at an angle. They're both the, <laughs> both the needle bar and the presser bar. That's, that's correct. And so the presser foot is taller even when it's down. The distance between the top of the needle plate and where the mount is for the presser foot is taller on a 301 and it's also slanted. Yep. So the attachments that attach to the presser foot bar will not work on a featherweight and vice versa. But pretty much all the same attachments uh, were, were made for the slant needle machines as were made for the featherweight. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. There's only a couple that I can think of, and of course they're the spendy ones. Um, yep. But yep. The, the, yep. the ordinary everyday attachments, you know, your ruffler and, and binder and all those things like that, you can you can find them. Uh, they're not interchangeable, um, of course, but you can find them for both. But yeah, your rare ones, you know, your uh, oh uh, penguin uh, walking foot, uh, the single thread, and those are only available in that in that low shank um, that's right and and of course uh, the uh, featherweight and the 301 do share the same bobbin and and as david mentioned the you know the hook assembly and such is is the same um, but because of that angle being different the attachments uh, are not interchangeable Why Next. Would Corral, like, on my 1933 open up? ah that's a that's a very very good question. Uh, the question, David, is why will my gib hook not swing open on uh, my 1933 featherweight? Um, and the, uh, the short answer is uh, don't force it. Um, um, but uh, David, you wanna explain a little of that? Yeah, it, it actually will swing open once you take the whole hook assembly off the shaft and remove the safety spring in the back the the early featherweights had a different rotary hook system that was not very user friendly and it didn't take singer long to figure out that they didn't want either users or their techs to be taking the hook off the shaft to uh, get a thread jam out or get the bobbin case base out so after the first one and a half maybe two uh, production batches they switched over to the style of hook that we all know where the gib uh, arm is easy to release yeah. but no the, the, the answer is you've got to take the hook the whole hook assembly off the shaft and on the back side of it there's a safety spring system yeah and it's it's not very user friendly and um, one of the I've had a few customers with early machines that actually plan to use them and not just collect them and, and show them that have asked that that hook assembly be changed out so they can easily uh, take the bobbin case base out. And there's some people who like uh, the numbered tension knob system yep. uh, enough to swap that into the earlier machine. So I've sold a few machines where I've swapped out the hook and the tension unit to, to make it more user friendly. Yep, and I always I always encourage people when they do that to hang on to that original tension unit, hang on to that original hook assembly. The machine is is probably definitely has more value uh, with the original parts with it. Um, but as far as usability, fortunately, those pieces are interchangeable. Um, you know that was something when Burl designed our thread jam tool. Um, 
I said, man, you really need to, we need to redesign this so that it'll also work with that 33 uh, because that hook assembly is a little different because, yeah, getting a, th getting a thread jam, a massive thread jam out of a 33 requires a lot of work um, compared to, uh, you know, all the later ones. And, and now with a thread jam tool, it, it's, it's a quick, quick, quick fix. So, uh, that, but that's right. That thread jam, that thread jam tool is really genius. And uh, for, a, a, any of us that have been working on featherweights for a while and have cleared thread jams, um, if we're being honest, we've broken it. We've broke. We've broken the position finger off a couple of uh, bobbin case bases trying to get a thread jam loose. So that tool r really saved you some some grief. And yeah, that's great tool skinned up fingers and everything that you know trying to trying to force that so yeah but uh, hopefully that answers your question about that old style uh, hook assembly and on Christian has on the timeline where you can see uh, exactly why it's why it's a little bit different but uh, yeah next question Christian what's the average lifespan of a motor average lifespan of a motor uh, well Featherweights are going on 80 years old, and a lot of them that have been properly maintained are going super, super strong. Uh, but as you know, David, we've talked about this before. It is the one thing that always worried me so much about um, about the featherweight was eventually what happens when these motors die, and so. Um, when you know there is the Alpha So motor that can be put on. Um, you know and, and works but it's now no longer original um, so rewinding the motors um, and we're backed up a couple months on those but rewinding motors is uh, something that'll keep featherweights running uh, strong uh, into the future but the main thing uh, is just proper proper lubrication yeah it it takes a lot of normal use to wear out a motor on a featherweight when when I give my maintenance classes, um, people ask about well, do I need to check the brushes on my motor? And uh, I and I tell them, let me look at your machine. I can tell you without taking <laughs> the brushes out if it needs to have them replaced. Because if the machine it, it still has all the decals intact, clear coat's really good. It obviously hasn't been used enough to wear out motor brushes. Yeah, and so just you know leave it alone if it's yeah. running run it well leave it alone but you know if you run onto a machine that's really been hard used um obviously motor brushes need to be changed before it gets to the point where th they'll stop running before they do a lot of damage to the uh, uh before the springs start running on the armature obviously yeah but but uh, it, it takes a lot of hard use to wear out a motor or if somebody has oiled it in the past, that often spells doom for these motors. So, but to answer yeah. a question about the life expectancy, I would say more featherweights are still running on their original motors than ones that have had them replaced by many, many times. So, oh yeah, I would. You should never would agree. Pro properly maintained, you should never wear it out. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And that, I mean, that is the reason, I mean, you carry uh, the So Retro Grease um, because it, that's, if if you want the motor to run cool and to actually get lubricated, it's got to have that low melting point uh, grease in there uh, to do that. So uh, that's, yep. that's key to maintaining uh, longevity. Yeah, and I, I would certainly like to say I've been very pleased with that So Retro Grease. It's the uh, the best single product for both motors and gears that's out there and uh, that's what I use in my shop and put in all of my maintenance kits that we use in our classes is that if you're so retro it's excellent yeah well I'm uh, yeah Great product next question Christian does David have local workshops okay David they're asking about uh, local workshops what is your uh, what is your schedule and how would they find out about that yeah, on my on my website, which is uh, quilters and then the dash symbol connection dot com. Uh, if you look under classes or calendar, uh, you you'll get to our workshops. And I do have uh, uh, I put the whole year's worth of workshops up early this year. 
unfortunately, we have not had any since the early part of March. But um, the first one you'll see on the calendar is second weekend of June. I think it's the 13th and 14th. I had so many people ask me for back-to-back -back, a 221 workshop or the featherweight workshop one day and the 301 workshop the next uh that i actually for the first time this year put that on the calendar and that's the next one coming up in june and i think we are going to actually try to have that workshop uh we're going to be wearing masks in here uh my my you're looking at one of the tables uh or at least half of one uh on the video here so we can do some social distancing but we'll be wearing masks and i'm and i believe i'm going to open that uh, uh, I'll be changing the website here within the next few days to open each day individually. We mm. do have a few people that have paid and signed up for both days. I need to check with them and see if they're coming to both. See if see if they're still going to come because uh, not not everybody's still willing to travel from out of the area yet. Yeah, but but I believe we're going to start up next month, and um, I will. I may very well add more classes to make up for the people we've had to put off for March, April, and May. Yeah, and as we were talking yesterday, one of these days, one of these days we'll have to do a class together because that, <laughs> that would be great. It'd would be a lot of fun. David's yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, next question, Christian. Can you overpolish the upper tension discs and cause a finicky tension problem? It's Rick. Okay, so here we've got a question from our friend Rick Armeo, and he's probably trying to stump us because uh, Rick's a, a little bit of an expert in his own right. Um, so what is his question is, can you overpolish the upper tension discs and cause a finicky tension problem? And ca can you overpolish the upper tension discs and cause a finicky uh, tension problem? Uh, if if that was possible, I would say it would result from whatever you left on the disc to polish them. In other words, if you use some kind of metal polish or wax or whatever you use to polish it up and you didn't get all of that off of there, yeah, you might have a tension problem. Yeah. I, I don't think I don't think singer left any t any texture in those discs. If you look at nearly brand new singer discs, they have a they have a chrome finish that doesn't have purposely have a texture, so I don't know that you could. I don't know that you could over polish it to the point where you couldn't compensate with a little bit more spring pressure. Right. I, yeah, I I would agree. Uh, you know, here in the shop, uh, when they're cleaning up tension units, they first run through the ultrasonic cleaner to get the grime off there, and then they you know they go on a buffing wheel. So they've got that that smooth finish. You want smooth, um, but um, I've never experienced an issue with it being in essence too smooth. I I, I agree with that. I yeah. agree with that. N next question, Christian. Uh, is a lag time normal on a featherweight that's going to be for controller checking probably? Uh, the, the question is, is a lag time normal mm -hmm. on, a, on a featherweight? And I'm assuming they're talking about, you know, stepping on the pedal and there's a lag before it, before it takes off. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds like what they're asking. And, um, it's not uncommon. It could be uh, there. There would be a there would be a list of things that I would look at. Mm -hmm. if someone brought a machine that was doing that. First of all, the belt not being too tight, or it the belt being one of the older um, replacement aftermarket belts, which for years and years were too thick, too wide, and too stiff. Yep. So first thing I'd look at is the the belt itself and the tightness of it um, I'd probably when I had the belt off I would be spinning the machine by hand to make sure uh, you know grabbing the balance wheel and turning it towards me to just to make sure the machine turned freely and there was no unusual internal resistance in the machine yep. 
uh, but assuming that there wasn't, and there was the gears, the gears were properly lubricated, the machine turned very freely, um, and it had a good belt on it that wasn't too tight, I would then check the motor brushes, clean the soot off them while you have them out, use the Q-tip and maybe some electric motor cleaner mm -hmm. judiciously to clean the commutator ring. And uh, a lot of people say that if you start with the needle in a certain position, uh, maybe just after the top of the travel of the take-up lever, then uh, the, the machine will start easier. Yeah. But it, but if you paid attention to all those things and you still, and, and foot controller adjustment as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you paid attention to all those things, you probably then have a, and still have the problem, you probably have a motor issue and need to send the machine or the motor off to the federal shop. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would agree with all, with all those things there. Uh, you know, belt uh, either too tight and the motor's trying to overcome it, or too loose and the pulley's slipping. So if you, if you look over there and you see that it's not starting because the pulley's spinning, but the machine's not going. Um, yeah, but uh, that's what we do with every machine that comes in. And I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a troubleshooting process, and and um, you can you can tell a lot by how a machine feels when the belt is off it. Um, yeah, as David mentioned, so yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, next question. How often, if ever, do you find clogged grease wicks? How often, if ever, do we find clogged grease wicks? Uh, and the grease wicks we're talking about are the wicks inside the motor. Um, actually, Krishna, I've got this uh, cutaway motor here. If you can put that up there on the screen and I'll show. This is... Uh, Here's a, uh, a wick uh, right here. This is where you, you put the grease in. And if that felt wick is completely clogged, you can't get anything else to go through it. Oh, here, so I'll put it back up here. Okay, you see it there now? Okay. So, uh, you know, there's, there's actually two things here. It, in theory, it actually could be clogged because of um, the wrong type of grease put in there. And often they are just, simply dried out and are rock hard if the machine hasn't been ran in decades. Uh, most of the ones that get sent to us are clogged from, um, you know, usually a well-meaning husband uh, putting some, you know, axle bearing grease or something in there that um, that clogs it up and just will not go down through there. Or even the, the modern sewing machine greases that, you know, have that 400 degree uh, melting point to them. They're not made to melt, and so it's just going to sit in there and and not do anything. Uh, what would you, uh, anything to add on that, David? No, I, I would agree with what you said. Um, and and I, uh, as, as a fix for that, at least to get some lubricant down onto the shaft of the motor, uh, that might be one of those times where one drop of oil in the motor port mm -hmm. is, you know, it, you, you hear us uh, say all the time, no oil in the motor, but uh, th that might be uh, an exception to the rule, but I yeah. uh, we'll hesitate to say that because don't want everybody rushing out and putting oil, putting oil in their motor. Yeah, but yeah, that, exactly. That is the way to, to soften up a wick that might be dried up and clogged to where uh, it can start the flow of lubricant through that wick. If yeah. It's not, and as, have to be as long as you hold your oiler to where you can see it and make sure that you're putting one drop in. But if you put the end in there, it's not one, it's not one squeeze of oil. It's, it's literally one drop on one of those, those felt wicks. And the felt wicks are kind of like, um, we replace a lot of felt wicks here in motors, especially when they come in for servicing, but replacing felt wicks is not an easy thing. They've got a couple little jigs that they use in the tech department to, to put to put replacement wicks in there, but replacement wicks are not, um, they're not like the feet on the bottom of the machine or something where you just, oh, I should probably replace those. Uh, that's not usually usually the case. It's one of those that if you know your motor's getting uh, uh, lubrication, it's not overheating or anything like that, uh, we don't recommend just randomly replacing those um, unless unless they're a problem. I have uh, occasionally I've ran into somewhere I think they got hard and, and people started poking in there with a needle 
and then they're thinking, oh, there's some sort of gunk in there, and they start fishing it out, and really what they're doing is they're chewing that felt wick up, and the next thing you know, it has no wick left in there at all, and uh, that's not a good thing, because then any grease you put in there is just going to be straight onto the, uh, straight onto the shaft, and uh, what could act more like putting oil in it so uh, overall uh, you don't have to worry about that and uh, typically you don't have to replace those wicks very often but Christian mm -hmm. what do you got for us um, is it okay to wax over an area where the clear coats go on? oh that's a good question is it okay to wax over an area um, at, wax over an area where the clear coat is already gone uh, David what do you what do you say there it, it depends on what's happened to the clear coat. If if the if the clear coat is cracked, is is checking, you know, if the if the surface of the machine looks like a jigsaw puzzle, kind of with mm -hmm. all the cracks in it, putting a wax on it is only going to result in what looks like grouted tile because most of these waxes are white, right? And it's going to get down in the cracks in the clear coat, and it's not going to look good once a clear coat is degraded to that point um, you're better off just wiping it down with sewing machine oil um, obviously you don't want to put so much oil on it that you ruin the next fabric you put on it but yeah. for, for looks that's about all you can do at that point um, it, it really takes a little bit of experience cleaning up these machines to be able to look at it and tell how the machine's going to respond mm -hmm. to the wax. Uh, I, I like the Zimol wax for a lot of applications, but it doesn't work on every machine, especially if there's some problems with clear coat. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I tell people, if you go to an auto detail shop and you walk in and you look on what they have on the shelf, they don't just have one wax product mm -hmm. on the shelf. Mm -hmm. They've got a whole shelf full of products. Yeah, because they know what works best on different finishes, and I think featherweights are the same way. the The earlier machines have different have a, a very different clear coat than the later machines mm -hmm. in the in the way it responds to the products used on it. So, uh, you know, tread carefully. But if you've got a clear coat, degraded clear coat on a machine. Uh, then it's probably also degraded on the decals and you want to be very careful what you use. So sewing machine oil in that case may be the best you can do. It, it may not ever shine up to a really shiny finish. Yeah, very, 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 uh, very true. Um, you know, we see so many machines come through the shop here and they all look different. But, you know, I was on the phone with a gal the other day uh, and she had a machine and she wanted to wax it because she wanted the surface clean for her fabric and everything. Um, and she was saying, you know, what kind of wax should I use? And so I said, well, tell me a little bit about the machine. And so uh, in that case, it had no decals left at all. And so uh, no wax, whether Zymol or anything else is going to... Uh, is going to uh, bring back um, life, but it can make it can make some good. Uh, it can make the surface smooth for for your fabric to glide on it and everything like that. So I said, you know, find whatever your husband has out in the garage for some car wax and put a little wax on there, um, because Zymol is uh, great for protecting a surface of a of a beautiful machine, but it's not a miracle worker on one that's that's been uh, highly degraded. So, yeah. Right. Yep. Okay, so Christian's telling us, uh, time flies when you're having fun. Christian's telling us we got about five minutes and a couple more questions left here. So. All right. <laughs> okay, so this is a question that, that uh, we've been getting uh, emails and phone calls on daily, and that is, uh, why are the thread jam tools and the small screwdrivers out of stock? Uh, the thread jam tools, um, they should be um, they should be in stock probably middle of this next week. Um, they're all made except for the pins, which were back ordered somewhere. Uh, so many things are just hard to get right now. And then <clears throat> the small screwdrivers, uh, you know, Germany is one of these uh, countries that was hit 
hard with the COVID thing, just like the rest of us. And um, they've been on order since, you know, mid January or something like that. And it's looking like we should have them in stock about uh, uh, June 18th or something's their latest uh, shipping quote uh, time that they've given me. But uh, again, <laughs> there's no guarantees on, on shipping on anything right now in, in, in our current uh, state of economy and, and world uh, shipping stuff. So, yeah, Christian. No, let me add to that. that uh, I, I sell it in my online store and here in the shop parts for a lot of machines. And um, we all, all of our, all the sewing machine parts dealers get their parts from basically the same distributors. And I'm starting to see a lot of out of stock on things you wouldn't expect, like for instance, Schmetz needles. Yeah. Um, and so I, I know that's disruption in the supply chain. So if you, you know, if you're listening to this broadcast, if you, you've got something coming up, you know, you're going to need, I would encourage you to get it on order because we're starting to see out of stock on things that we that we're never out of stock in the past. Yeah, well, I, I've never had issues with getting Schmetz needles in, in the past, and we ran out of almost every single um, needle that we've got. We are almost 100% back in stock on Schmetz as of uh, this last weekend. I think they came in Friday night, um, which I was thankful to see because without needles, you can't sew, and, and that was getting a little frustrating. Um, but yeah, very, very true. Supply chains are just, uh, there's a lag time in there. And so I'd say if you've got a retreat or something coming up, make sure you've got those things on hand uh, plenty ahead of time. So Christian, did you have another one for us? Oh, yeah, this will be this will be good. Well, this will be our, our last question and I'll refer this to you, David. How about replacing the internal belt on a white featherweight? No, thanks. <laughs> That's a big job. And uh, I, I have never had to do it. Mm -hmm. I think I've only seen one machine with a bad belt on it. And um, I, don't, I don't think anybody, any of our suppliers catalogs that belt, mm -hmm. although you could probably buy it by length. It's a tooth belt. Yep. Uh, but it's a big job and I've not had to do it. So I'm gonna defer that back to you. Yeah, it, it's not a fun job. I've only done it a couple times and, um, and I know they've done it uh, a little bit back in the tech department and usually it's because of just extreme, uh, extreme use. I've seen a couple featherweights, uh, white ones that have come in where the paint was almost wore off completely. They looked almost like it was used in a factory or something. And there was enough give or stretch and cog wear on those belts that uh, couldn't keep the machine in, in time. Um, that was several years ago, that particular one that I'm thinking of. Um, and I don't remember offhand whether that was a, a customer's machine or whether it was one of our own, but uh, there's so, so much involved into pulling that top shaft and everything so that you can do that, that it, that it really, uh, it's almost all the process that you would have to go through, like if you were gonna have a machine repainted and completely disassembled. It's not a, it's not a you know, 15 minute uh, fix in the shop uh, for anybody. And, uh, you know, I, I probably question, unless the machine had sentimental value or something like that, I probably would question the labor time involved versus the value of the machine on that. And, and that was definitely true back when those machines were $350. Yeah. But I, I, can, I can understand it being a legitimate question now that the white machines have, got, have gone up so much in price. But yeah, any shop that's going to charge a, even a reasonable labor rate is going to have a ton of time in it. You're going to have a really big investment in changing that belt out. So I, I would not do that job. I would definitely refer those customers to you guys. <laughs> well, it definitely is not a routine maintenance type thing. There would be absolutely no reason to change that belt um, unless it had broke or, or stretched or you know something like that. So I would say take care of that belt, keep the grease and everything like that off of it, um, and uh, so it, it still so should it would last. Be like setting, it would be like setting up a lunch appointment. I'd have my people contact your people. <laughs> 
<laughs> Very true. Well, David, this has been a, a lot of fun. We'll have to put this on the schedule and do it again sometime. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you all for watching and uh, give us a few days and uh, we'll, we'll get these uh, posted to, uh, to the group so you can permanently uh, watch them and refer back to for questions or anything like that. Uh, but uh, David, I'm going to say so long for today and uh, when this gets all, all over, right. we need to get together and have lunch sometime. That would be, I'd love that. Thank you for inviting me for this. It has been fun and uh, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Okay, take care. Thanks a lot, David. Bye-bye.